Hello and welcome everyone to Varsity Tutors, where we know that not as many field trips are happening in school this year. Um, with everyone learning remote, that's just not happening. So we thought we would take the coolest field trip we could think of to the most remote location anyone's ever taken a field trip to, space. And so we've got astronaut Leland Melvin here. You may have seen him in a Varsity Tutors commercial recently to tell us all about what it's like to uh, to be on a rocket on a mission to space, what that whole rocket launch is like. We also have, let me show him to you here, Leland's launch control team. He was telling me yesterday, it's not mission control until you're in orbit, it's launch control to start. These are members of the school at home program at Varsity Tutors who are on their field trip from their school at, at school at home. If you're interested in learning about school at home, check us out at varsitytutors.com. All right, a couple things before we hand it over. We want to keep this really interactive and fun. So for those of you watching in the, the main classroom, there's a chat panel to the right of where we are. Leland's going to ask you some questions to find out what you know about space. Answer them there. And if you've got questions for him, ask them there. Put your name on them so we know who's asking. And at the end of class, we'll do a Q&A where you can, we'll, we'll talk about a lot of those questions. Also, make sure you've got a camera nearby uh, because right before Q&A, in about T minus 30 minutes or so, we're going to give you an opportunity to take a space selfie with a real astronaut, Leland. And if you upload it to Instagram, you'll be entered to win a astronaut patch and an autographed astronaut photo just like that. So, uh, so make sure you got those cameras ready. All right. Before we give it to Leland, I want to talk to Launch Control. School at Home Launch Control, are you ready? Let's tell them what time it is in T minus three, two, one. We have a liftoff. That's right. We have liftoff. Only one person I know who's here has ever had liftoff. So Leland, tell us what that's all about. Oh my goodness, take it away, Varsity Tutors, school at home. That was fantastic. Hey, everyone, I can't wait to see one of you guys go off in space one day. But today, we're going to talk about the diary of a rocket launch, what it's like, what it feels like to go to space, but also what are the equations that help divine how you get to space? And I see some kids from all over the country. I see Xavier out there asking, how fast does a rocket go? Lola out in Portland, Oregon, saying, well, how do you feel? Well, we're going to answer some of those questions today. Exactly what it feels like to go to space and the rocket equation. Now, on the next slide, you know, you have this question. I'm asking you this guy's question. What is that astronaut experience like? What do you think some of the things that you feel when you're traveling, as Xavier asked, at 17,500 miles per hour? How do you think your body would feel? How do you think your mind would feel? Does anyone, anyone have any questions around that? You think you're nervous? You think you're excited? What, do, you, do you think you're gonna put your phone on, on, uh, on mute so that uh, on airplane mode, even though it would have to be space plane mode? Well, those are some of the things that you know, we think about as we're getting ready to go to space. And I think some of the things that, you know, when you get ready for a test, You've studied for it, you've trained for it. And when we're sitting in the rocket, we've gone through many, many years of training, basic training, advanced training, all ready for that three, two, one liftoff. And that's what we get ready for. So you guys ready to get into what it's like to be in space? We're gonna watch a video now. And this video is gonna show you a lot of the things that I actually experienced as I was going off into space. Brian, you ready to run the video? All right, so you got the Space Shuttle Atlantis. This was in 2008, my first launch on STS-122. I had four, five of my friends with me. There's Steve and Dex, there's me, there's Rex, there's Stan Love, Hans, and Leo. Now, three hours before we launch, we have to get into the vehicle. We're gonna so watch this a video now, and this video so, is gonna show you. So this is Steve getting in, I'm gonna mute that. Steve's getting in. He's the commander. Here's Alan Poindexter. He's the pilot. So they're in the front two seats. Then you see me sitting behind Dex. We call him Dex, Alan Poindexter. And then in the middle is Rex, Rex Walham. So we're on the flight deck of the Space Shuttle Atlantis. Now down on the mid deck below us 
there's Leo getting in, and then there's Hans getting in on the other side. They're both from Europe. The one is Fran French and one is German, and then Stan Love gets in the middle. So we are about to take off. We're doing a little fist bump. You want to go ahead and give the sound there, Brian? Let's see what it sounds like. Uh-oh. Okay, we're going to have to go back real quick. He's going to run this again. We're going to drag it over to where we're about to launch in space. And if once you... we're all set, we uh, walk out of crew quarters here and had a chance to uh, to wait. Yeah, there we go. We're going to get back to right there. And so, Rex on the flight deck. Three, two, just a few one. minutes before launch here, we're ready to go. We're excited. We heard that the weather's good. And I'll just let you listen to the launch here for a Main few safety seconds. systems arm. Down suppression system water activated. And Oh yeah! All right, three and a hundred. Here we go. Woo! You know what I do? Oh, no. Okay. Seven seconds, Steve. There you go. That, that, that was me. Wow. You said it was really good, man. Brian, can you mute that? Okay, guys. So I felt this scream come out of me. I was yelling and screaming and we had a big smile on my face. We we're so excited. My body was actually shaking and rocking and rolling. My head was moving so much that I couldn't even see the screens. And we have screens all around us. At two and a half minutes, the solid rocket boosters get jettisoned. And so now it's starting to go a little bit faster because we've lost some weight. And we'll talk about that in our next section on the rocket equation. We're doing a rotation. We're now eight and a half minutes and we are now in space, the main engine's cut off. We're gonna jettison the external tank. You see the tank, the orange tank on the bottom goes back into the atmosphere and falls down. And my first thing that I did once we got to space, I undid my seatbelt. And you'll see in a video in a minute where I'm actually floating over to the window. So this tank is falling down. I'm getting a video camera and I'm taking that camera and looking out the overhead window at the tank falling back down to earth. And there's a little bit of fuel left in the tank. So you can see the actual tank rotating and the sun illuminating the fuel. And that's, that's how we get to space. And your body feels very, very free. You're floating. We're doing these turns and flips to, you know, to actually uh, take pictures of the, of the shuttle. But you're now weightless, now you're floating, now you're working as a team together. So that's the experience as an astronaut to get to space. Now we're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about how do you build that vehicle? How do you get the, all the things ready to know exactly what engineering equations you need to do and all those things. So on the next slide, this is called the rocket equation and now, I know a lot of you haven't taken math classes yet. Some of you have, some of the eighth graders and seventh graders, you've had some, some classes already, but this is an equation that governs how you get the fastest velocity to get to space. So you see velocity, you see mass, you see some constants, but it really all boils down to velocity equals thrust over mass. Now, what is thrust? Thrust is what's coming out of the, of the rocket engines, the solid rocket boosters, and the main engines, and the mass is the weight of the entire vehicle. So if you go faster, you need to either have more thrust or less weight. At launch, the, the whole stack is 4 million pounds. So we've got to move 4 million pounds and accelerate it to 17,500 miles per hour. And one of the ways we do that is we, we light the engines, we like the solid rocket boosters and we go. Now I'm gonna show you a quick little video and explain to you some of the things that are happening as we launch to go to space. Brian, you can run that other video. I see Miss Kelly on the, on the screen. <laughs> hey Kelly. All right, so the three main engines light, the external tank is what's fueling those engines. There's liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen going through that orange tank into those three main engines. The two white things are the solid rocket boosters. They have solid fuel. So every time they're, they're ignited, there's fuel is burning. So you're losing weight. So as you lose weight, you gain velocity. 
And at around that point, we're probably going about 5,000 miles per hour. And at two and a half minutes, as we said earlier, we jettison those tanks. Jettison means getting rid of them. Once all the fuel in the tanks is used up, we then get rid of them because that's extra weight that we don't need because the fuel is gone. So we get up to about two and a half minutes. They get jettisoned. They're about to go right now. Here we go. You see the orange tank. You see the two boosters. And now they're finishing up their last little bits of fuel. They're, they're, they're hanging in there, though. Look at them. They're still going. And uh, they're about to go right now. Brian, I think this is the long extended remix version of the video. <laughs> Okay, so SRB separation, two and a half minutes, 2.5 minutes, and we should be going now. So that goes, and then we are gonna have, these three engines are still performing at 100, 104%. So they're the main, uh, after those boosters get jettisoned, they're the main piece that's getting us to space then. And then that uh, fuel tank is just still performing, still, we have these gas sensors in the fuel tank that let us know that once the fuel is empty that the engine engines will cut off and solid rocket booster separation, I think. So let's, let's keep going, Brian. So we get to two and a half minutes and when we first start the launch, let's go to the live video. When we first start the launch, we have something called these frangible nuts. Can you guys see these nuts here? So these are the bolts that actually hold down the entire stack, the orange tank, the white solid rocket boosters, and there's a charge, see right there, that hole right there? These were the bolts that I launched with on my first mission. There's a, there's a pyrotechnic charge, there's an explosive charge in there that blows the bolts away. So as soon as we are ready to launch, we're, we're standing up like this, the main engines come on, they tilt forward a little bit because they're, the bolts are holding right here. So when these come on, the main engines come on, this whole thing tilts forward. When it comes back straight up, we blow those bolts, the eight bolts, and then this whole thing takes off. And on the next slide, you can see that there's a frangible nut. There's the bolt there. Can you pull that up, Brian? So we've got this frangible nut. That's the bolt that I just showed you. So at T0 equals zero, they explode and then we go off. Then we have the boosters at two and a half minutes. They come back down and you're looking at a picture of the SpaceX boosters that come back down on a barge or come back down on land. And they make that more efficient so that they don't have to send them off and get them service. They can, they can refill those right there at the Cape, Cape Canaveral. And then I mentioned the tank. The tank drops at eight and a half minutes once all the fuel is used up. So as you see, we've lost boosters, we've lost the tank, and this is all weight that's being taken off of the vehicle to get us up into orbit. And so that's kind of the analysis of the different phases of launch, velocity and thrust, as we talked about before. And so those are the main things that we wanna mention about a launch. Now, how we felt was one thing, how we get there is another thing, and then, Many of you in this, in this class are gonna one day maybe go to space. So I went up to the International Space Station. See the space station behind me? That's the International Space Station right there. Let me show you. We helped build that. I added this component right here, the Columbus Laboratory. It's a $2 billion laboratory where we do experiments, like science experiments on our bodies, on materials and different things. So some of you, one day may help build a space station like that. Some of you in this, in this classroom will maybe go back to the moon. And if you look at this picture, I said 17,500 miles to get to the space station. Well, if you look at this, we need to go 31,000 miles per hour to get to the moon. In the Apollo program, we had the Saturn V rockets. We, we launched those Saturn Vs that got us to the moon. Some of you, will go to new places. And there's Mars, we need 36,000 miles per hour. Where are some of the places that you would wanna go out there that have to do with the rocket equation and thrust and velocity and mass? How many of you would wanna to go to another solar system? What would it take to get to another solar system? We would need new technology. We would need new ways of traveling because to get to a different solar system, 
it takes light years. We talk about 8 million miles to Mars, 240,000 miles to the moon. But when you think about going to a whole nother solar system, it's even much, much further away, like light years. It's like the distance you have to travel in an entire year. And that's a long time. That's a really long time. So um, I think you guys understand the rocket equation. I think you understand how it feels to be an astronaut in space. And I'm gonna go back to my space shuttle right here because when you get to space, there are things that you have to do, right? We're not just going for a joyride in space. This mission was to build the International Space Station that's behind me. And so in this payload bay of the space shuttle, there are two doors that open up and inside of that, we had the Columbus Laboratory. So how many of you play video games out there? Any video game players out there? I see Andrew raising his hand. I see Luke raising his hand. Hey, Xavier, are you a video game player? Lola, are you a video game player? Okay, I see some hands being raised out there. So if you know how to play video games, you would be a great robotic arm operator. So when we open these payload bay doors, we use this robotic arm to grab down into the payload bay to take things out, whether it's a satellite, like if you're watching television right now, it might be through a satellite that's orbiting the planet. Those satellites are up at maybe like 80,000 miles up, okay? And they're giving communication back to your home so you can watch you know, this class right here, Varsity Tutors. So we can deploy satellites, we can deploy pieces of space stations, we can deploy all those things. And there are new companies besides NASA that's building rockets like SpaceX, like Virgin Galactic, like uh, Blue Origin. All of these companies are places where you may work one day. You may be a Blue Origin astronaut or a SpaceX astronaut, but this payload bay is where everything comes out for the space shuttle and we build this space station. Now, where, where else would you guys like to go besides the solar system, the moon and Mars? Brian, do you see any, any other questions out there from some of these future astronauts? Well, we've got lots of questions, Leland, definitely. Hey, there was, um, and so keep your questions coming in. Like we said at the beginning, type them in, tag your name on them so Leland knows who's asking. Um, there was one question, uh, we got too excited to show them the launch. One question we had for them, which I wanna come back to here, Leland, let me, let me pop it up because this one, the answer kind of blew my mind uh, and uh -huh. that model of yours kind of shows off why. So, uh, so let me pop this one up. I think this one's pretty fascinating. Yeah, so to get to orbit, let me answer this one. To get to orbit, what percentage of a rocket's initial weight has to be fuel? Does anyone know, is it A, 10%, B, 25%, C, 50%, D, 75%, E, 90%. How many of you think it's A, B, C, D, or E? Well, if you look at that space shuttle, most of that space shuttle and that stack is actually fuel. So it's 90% of that structure is actually fuel. And that's pretty amazing. So if you're going to go to Mars, you're going to need a lot of fuel to get there. And there are other types of fuel besides solid fuel and liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. We're looking at even solar electric propulsion, using solar power to help us create a plasma that will get us to Mars. And so that's, that's kind of a cool technology. One of you today may be developing some other type of technology, but to do that, you have to eat your green beans, have to study really hard, listen to your parents and teachers, and be curious, right, Brian? You gotta be curious, always be curious, because you, you can solve all kinds of problems. You can help save our planet. You can help save other planets. You can do really incredible things. And so what other questions do we have? I think we got a lot of time, don't we, Brian?
Oh yeah, yo, you um, yeah, I think you were going at seventeen thousand five hundred miles an hour <laughs> toward the end there. So, um, hey, I don't think you have to worry about this group not being curious. We've got amazing questions. Um, I want to take some from the. I guess they're the mission control team now, right, Leland? They, it was launch control, control when we started, but now we're in orbit. We're going at seventeen five hundred. So, um, Aubrey has asked a, a couple of really good questions, including kind of you know one of my favorites. So, um, Aubrey from the uh, the mission control team. Do you want to jump on screen and, uh, and ask Leland your question? Um, well, hi, I'm Aubrey. And I want to know what it's like to look out and see space. What it's like to look out and see space. So 17,500 miles per hour, we get to space, we're under our seatbelts, and I first looked down, but then as soon as I looked up into the blackness of space, it was stunningly beautiful. I could see lots of stars. I could even see something called the Aurora Australia's. It's a green, beautiful green glow. And it's where high energy particles from the sun are actually hitting our atmosphere. You know, the atmosphere that we breathe. If you look at this picture right here, you see that blue line right there? That little blue line, that's our atmosphere. That's what we breathe. So the particles hit that atmosphere and it causes it to glow in green and blue and red and all these different colors. And so I saw this light show when I was in space. It was really beautiful. It was really gorgeous. So when you go to space and if you're in the northern hemisphere, you see the Aurora Australis. If you're below the Earth in the southern hemisphere, you see the Aurora Borealis, no, Borealis in the north, Australis in the south, like Australia in the south. That's a great question. All right, another good question. Uh, we'll take one from uh, you know from uh, from outer space, I guess, from uh, from outside of uh, mission control. And I thought this one was great. You know, with all those exciting things to do and see, Braylon wanted to know how do you sleep in space? How do you sleep in space? Good question, Braylon. In space, everything floats. You float. If you have hair, your hair floats. So you're moving around like this, and. The, the key to being in space is, are you the kind of person that has to sleep with something like wrapped around you? Like when you're on laying in your bed, you maybe have a cover over top of you, maybe have a pillow, but in space, because everything floats, if you put a cover around you, like a, a quilt or a blanket, it would just float away from you. So we have sleeping bags and we actually bungee the sleeping bags to the wall, to the floor, because remember in space, there's no up or down. So you can be on the wall sideways, you can be on the ceiling, you can be on the floor, or you can just be suspended in the middle of the flight deck or the mid deck. And because you're in the sleeping bag, you could actually float out of the sleeping bag. So we have Velcro that we can Velcro ourselves inside the sleeping bag. Now, Brian, if, if Braylon, if you wanted to have a pillow in space, would a pillow work? What do you think? Do you think a pillow would work? No, because a pillow would just float away from you. So if you want a pillow to feel the sensation of a pillow on your head, you've got to Velcro the pillow around your head. And that's how you sleep in space. That's amazing. I uh, I may just Velcro a pillow to my head tonight just because <laughs> just to feel a little bit more like uh, like space. Um, hey, one other question uh, that I think a lot of people had is we talked about you know the rocket equation and all those kind of things and and you know jettisoning the tanks um, and one of the reasons you guys you go faster does it feel different? Like can you feel it when uh, you know when the the solid boosters drop or when the fuel tank drops? And, and what does that feel like? Yeah, so as you're, as you're launching, you know, three, two, one, liftoff, at eight seconds, you're going 100 miles an hour. But our goal is to get to 17,500. And if you look at this patch that I have on, see this patch right here? This patch says Mach 25. Mach 25 is, one Mach is the speed of sound. So if you're on, if you're on planet Earth and you're traveling around 700 miles an hour, that's Mach 1, okay? But if you're going Mach 25, that's 17,500 miles per hour. So when you come home, you actually get this patch because you've flown Mach 25. 
And so, so what was the question again? The speed, what was the question, Brian? Do you feel it when the, uh, the boosters it. drop and all that? Can you feel a difference yeah. in speed or, or just, yeah. you know, what does it feel like? So you're lifting off, you're moving, you're shaking, you're rolling. And then the SRBs, the solid rocket boosters jettison, you feel a little burst of acceleration because that weight comes off. And then we throttle the engines back. We have to throttle them back some because the actual um, structure, this whole structure, if you exceed three Gs, does anyone know what a G is? Okay. I think I think Andrew knows what a G is, right? Or Kelly knows what a G. I think I see Kelly shaking her head. A G is the gravitational pull. By you standing on Earth, you're getting pulled down to the Earth by one G. Okay. But when you're accelerating through the atmosphere, you're pulling three G's. So if you weigh a hundred pounds on Earth, you would feel like you weigh 300 pounds in the spaceship. Isn't that crazy? So as you're flying in the spaceship, you're getting three Gs. And if you try to lift your arm up, if I were to hold this space shuttle and lift my arm up, this thing, let's say this weighs 10 pounds, well, maybe five pounds. It would weigh 15, would feel like it weighed 15 pounds because it's experiencing three times the gravitational pull of what you feel on planet Earth. And if you go to the moon, and if you go to Mars, they have different gravitational pulls. It's a fraction of what you feel here. So if you were on Mars, you could probably jump, like Andrew, how tall are you? You're probably like, what, four feet, maybe three and a half feet on five feet. No, you're not five feet. You're not five. I know, I know you're not five feet. Maybe you're four feet. But Andrew, if you were on Mars, and you wanted to dunk a basketball in a 10 foot goal, you could probably do it because there's not as much gravity on Mars as there is right here on earth. So you can jump much higher on Mars and on the moon than you can here on earth. So as we're accelerating, I'm feeling really, really heavy. I'm feeling so heavy because it's three times my weight. I feel like I'm 200 pounds. So I feel like I'm 600 pounds. And then your chest is getting squashed down because you're laying on your back and the G's are coming into your chest. So you feel like it's hard to breathe. You're like, oh, I have to take really deep, oh, really deep breaths, right? And then you get to space and all that motion stops. And now everything you dropped around you is now floating by you. Your chest gets lighter. You feel more free. If you have hair, like I said, it floats and you undo the seatbelt and now you're just floating away. So from zero speed to 17,500 miles per hour and in between there, you feel really, really heavy. Now I gotta tell you one other thing, Brian, I'm gonna have to share this with them. This is about the rocket equation, but it's also about the launch experience, right? So when I got to space, I was hungry because we had eaten like four hours before we launched to space. So we had under our seat, we had like a ham and cheese sandwich. Anyone like ham and cheese? Andrew, you like ham and cheese? Nora, do you like ham and cheese? Okay, Nora's shaking her head, she likes ham and cheese. So I pull up this ham and cheese sandwich and some potato chips and I'm eating, I'm really hungry. And then I've got to get to work. We got to open the payload bay doors. We've got to turn our rocket ship into our home now, right? So as we're working, I feel, I feel like a little weird. I feel like, wait a minute, something's, something's going on here. And so I knew that I was about to, you know, throw up. I felt kind of sick. I didn't feel sick, but I knew I had to do that. And so in space, if that happens, you can't just let it come out and just float everywhere. You have to catch it. So you have a little bag that you catch it and you put it away. And I'm telling you this because you might feel sick when you go to the moon. You might feel sick when you go to Mars, but you have a job to do. And even if you feel sick, you've got to take care of that and get over it, right? So we can move on and have a great mission. And that's, you know, right now with COVID and different things, we may not feel our best. We may feel sick a little bit, but we need to get through that and then keep moving forward, keep studying, keep working as a team. We've got mission control here, varsity tutors, uh, at school, you know, we're, we're here as a team helping get the mission going. 
And that's what we all have to do at home. Work as a team, work as a, a community, work as a civilization, humanity, all of us together. Because when I look at this, this planet right here, this is Argentina, this is Chile, this is Peru. These are the Andes Mountains. They're some of the tallest mountains in the world, like 20,000 feet high, these mountains right here. I took this picture from space. Now over here is Mars. I didn't take that picture because I haven't been to Mars yet, but one of you may be taking a picture, Brian, just like that, right? They may be taking a picture of the Martian surface when they're landing. And so, but if you get sick, if you get sick on the ground, if you get sick in space, it happens. Don't be embarrassed, don't be afraid. It happens. Just get through it, get over it, and keep moving forward, right? That's perfect. I have a follow-up question for you on those bags in just a second. But okay. I think as you're talking about, everybody's got a mission. We've got great questions. Please, everybody, keep the questions coming. Uh, we'll have time for a few more after this. But I do want to make sure I mentioned T-30 minus in my intro. We would do selfie with uh, you know a space selfie. And now we're talking about taking pictures and all that. Let's let's hit it right on the dot. T minus um, 30. This is your all opportunity. Right. If you've got a camera out there, uh, it's your opportunity. Take a picture with Leland. We'll give it about 45 seconds or so. So get those pictures out. Remember, if you upload those to Instagram, we'll put the instructions up on our way out. Um, you will be entered to win that space patch and an autograph picture. So Leland, take it away. All right, guys, let's take this picture. All right, look into the camera. Moms and dads and people get that camera out or kids get that camera out for selfie mode. Put it in front of, you stand in front of your computer so you can see me, so I can see you. And we're gonna take a picture in 10 seconds. Ready? 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Selfie. All right, one more, Brian, or we have time. What's the time like? Let's do it. We got time. Yeah, let's make sure people okay. get these pictures. This is fun. One more selfie. Now be creative on this one. We're gonna look up to space, all right? And point up to space like we're looking to space, okay? Ready? 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. All right. I think we got them, Brian. Some amazing pictures. All right. So while we do this, I want to put up the rules for everybody. I'll talk over the slide, then we'll go back full screen on Leland for uh, for his answer. So um, Leland, you were in space less than an hour or so when you had to use that first bag, right? Yes. How many yes. bags do you bring with you? And has anyone, so let me ask a couple questions. How many bags do you bring with you for how many days in space? And has the space station ever needed to radio down and say, guys, we're a little bit out of vomit bags? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. Once you get sick the first time, usually you don't keep getting sick. So most of the time, I think I had maybe four bags, you know, that I had for my personal self. I think there are probably some extra stowed away in the space shuttle. But, um, but some people get, you know, really sick. You have to give them a shot and put them to sleep. And after they wake up, they're usually feeling okay. It's letting your body get acclimated to being in this zero G environment. Because when you first get to space, think about it. You have these little sensors in your ears that let you know if your head's up or down or on the side or on the right. But those little rocks in those sensors, they don't have gravity pulling down on them. So they're, those little rocks are just moving everywhere in your inner ear. And because your eyes see that you're right side up, but these little things are spinning all around. You have a disconnect between your brain, your eyes and your ears, and that confuses your brain and that kind of makes you sick. So once your brain gets to where it rejects all the data coming from those inner ears, then everything is geared to on, on at orientation is geared to visual and you kind of reject all that other stuff. So I think it takes maybe for some people an hour, two hours, three hours to get acclimated. And then no more need for those for those bags. 
All right, we're all thankful for that. Um, hey, a couple of things. We, we're going to take, you know, probably another 10 minutes or so of questions. So keep the questions coming, everybody. Um, this is, is you know, you can tell it's, it's Leland's favorite part. We, uh, we always love these. Um, school at home folks at Mission Control look alive because we're going to go to some, uh, some live studio audience questions. But since we were just talking about the bags, uh, we got a little bit of a bad taste in our mouth. I want to go to one of uh, Julia um, out, uh, you know, out in the world asked this question, which I think is a, is a pretty good one. What's the food like in space? What's the food like in space? Wow. You know, we have, uh, you know, turkey tetrazzini, something you probably have in school, kind of a mixture of turkey with vegetables and different things. We have like chicken patties that are in aluminum foil that's kind of, you just kind of rehydrate. Uh, we have chocolate pudding cake. Think about this, chocolate cake and pudding combined together. So moist and gooey and chocolatey. That was one of my favorites. And because when you get to space that your taste buds, they're not as sensitive to, to taste, whether sweet or sour or anything. So in space, you actually like things that are really spicy. So shrimp cocktail with the cocktail sauce is one of the favorites. And so we'll eat, we'll probably go through all the shrimp cocktail in the first few days. And we got, you know, M&Ms and we've got, uh, you know, little cookies, but you don't have crackers because the crackers can break and all the little bits of the cracker can get in your eyes because everything floats away. So when we eat, we try to use a spoon and we try to play goalie and catch the things that are floating away and put it in your mouth. So, but the food's pretty good. You guys look like kings up there. It's pretty amazing. You get to, you get to play with your food and it's good food. Um, thank you for that. And, and really good question, Julie, on that one. Um, all right, Samantha here on Mission Control has a question that, you know, if I had a chance to ask a question, I would ask. So, um, Samantha, do you want to pop on and ask Leland? Sure. Um, my question was, what was the coolest thing that you ever saw in space? Oh, my goodness. Uh, the coolest thing. Um, I think it was, Samantha, I like your pink headphones, by the way. They're oh, pretty cool. Um, the coolest thing that I saw when I, was, when I was flying over my hometown in Lynchburg, Virginia, that's where I am right now. And I looked down, I could see the lights at night. And so when you're, when you're seeing the world at night, you see the footprint of humanity. You see your neighborhood, you see this community and the lights are different colors all over the planet because there could be flying over Africa and you see people with fires, you know, out in the middle of, of, you know, of the desert or places where they're burning a fire or something and you see the fire. So that's a different kind of light, but just seeing the different cities knowing that people are down there studying like you and working hard and thinking about going to space one day and knowing that they can do it because we all work together as one team like you on mission control right now. Good question. Awesome. That's really neat. Thank you for asking that. Cause uh, that's, that's what I would have asked if I had the chance. All right. Nora has a pretty similar question. So I want to go to her um, similar, but uniquely different enough. Um, Nora, do you want to ask Leland? Oh, hey, no, you're unmute. unmute Nora. There you go. Ah, let, me, let me hit Help that one Nora. again. There we go. Yeah, I just didn't hear you right there. All right, Nora, what's your question? I can't hear. Can oh, you hear? No. I, I, I can read lips. Uh, for whatever reason, we're not hearing volume, but I think, I, you know, I think you were good. That I, I saw you asking it. She wanted to know what's the coolest thing you did in space. So we asked what the coolest thing you saw. What's the coolest thing you yeah. did? Yeah. Oh my goodness, Nora, let me show you. So this is the Columbus Laboratory, I'm a model, I'm a model guy. And if you think about it, I showed you earlier, it's up there on the space station. So this was in the payload bay of the space shuttle. And I actually went and grabbed it with the robotic arm. I grabbed it like this, and then I started moving it around, just like, you know, it has an elbow joint, it's got a wrist joint, it's got a shoulder joint. So the arm is very similar to my arm, like what I'm moving right now. And I actually attached this to the International Space Station. This research laboratory grew the space station by one piece. And that's why it's so big because we had all of these different pieces put together with people from all around the world, countries from all around the world. And so I think that was, that was one of the coolest things that I did but one of the coolest things that happened was after I did that, Peggy Whitson, who was the first female commander, she invited us to have dinner over in the Russian segment. So we float over to have dinner 
and we were breaking bread. We were floating food to our mouths, you know. Hey, try this, Leland. Here's some uh, beef and barley. Poop. You know, we'd float back and forth. And then we looked out the, at the planet and we go around the planet every 90 minutes and see a sunrise and a sunset every 45 minutes. So I had a space smorgasbord eating with people from all around the world, looking at the world at the same time. So that I think that was the coolest thing that I did um, with people. And then the coolest thing that I did was install that Columbus Laboratory. Good question. It's a great question. Oh, that's great. Hey, um, um, so I want to thank you for uh, for the question, Nora. Um, a lot of people have been asking. So we got a lot of fascination with the rocket equation um, oh. and the amount of fuel that it takes. So a few questions that have been popping up um, from, you know, coming up pr pretty frequently are, um, one, how many gallons of fuel? Do you know what that would be? Mm. People thinking about kind of their normal gas tank. And then two, gallons. what would you do if you ran out of fuel in space? That's, let me start with that one. Because on my first mission, we have this external tank. And this external tank has two tanks in it. It's got a liquid oxygen tank on the top, liquid hydrogen tank at the bottom. And there's plumbing that runs those, those uh, liquids down to these tanks here. There are something called eco sensors in the top of the tank. There are four sensors. They're called uh, engine cutoff sensors. And so they monitor the level of fuel in each of these tanks. And if you run out of fuel, there are these very fast spinning turbo pumps that if they can't, they can't operate unless fuel's running through them. So you wanna make sure that your fuel gauges are working. And before we were about to launch, we had two of the fuel, fuel gauges not working properly. So we ended up not launching on that day. We had to take the whole shuttle stack back to the hangar and go in and fix those fuel sensors. So on the day of launch, we had four or four, because if you have one or two that fail, then you have another one fail, and you think the tank is empty, or you think the tank is full, but it's really empty, you're gonna have a problem with those pumps and you don't wanna have a problem on launch day. So, um, so that's, that's one of the things that uh, we, we have is these eco sensors so that you don't run out of fuel. And then the amount of fuel, well, the entire stack is, let me see, 4.5 million pounds, okay? And so probably, remember we said, probably 90% of that is fuel. So I don't know how many gallons, because some of it is solid fuel and some of it is liquid fuel. But if you just do it by weight, you tell me what 90% of 4.5 is. Do that math out there and that is gonna be your answer. That's a little over 4 million pounds. That's crazy to even, even try to fathom that amount of fuel. So um, pretty amazing. So I'm glad, I'm glad you guys caught it before you ran out of fuel. So uh, I'm, I'm very thankful for those sensors. Um, Luke in uh, the mission control team has had a bunch of amazing questions. So I want to make sure he gets one on camera here. So um, Luke, do you want to pop on and, uh, and ask, I'd pick one of yours. You've had such good questions this whole time. Um, hey, Luke. My name, is, my name is Luke Hodges, and I want to know, um, is there any high-gravity planets or all, of, or all of them except Earth low-gravity? Oh, there are definitely some high-gravity planets. Uh, I think Jupiter, I think, you know, the, the gravitational pull has to do with um, how big a planet is. So the larger planets have some really big gravitational pulls. I mean, to the point where it could probably pull your body so hard that it may even pull you apart. I know that black holes are very, very dense and are they have uber gravity on black holes. They, they can actually pull light. Now, a black hole is obviously not a planet, but there are planets that have very extreme, I don't know what the numbers are for the planets in our solar system, but there's some planets that are even much bigger than the planets we have in our solar system that would have uh, intense gravitational pulls. So you wouldn't even be able to jump like, you know, one inch high. You know, if you had like a 30 inch vertical, you probably have to jump like, you know, like one quarter of an inch because it's pulling you down so hard. That's a great question. Awesome, I like that. Couple more questions on other planets before uh, before we wrap up here. And thank you Lillian, for, for taking so many of these. A lot of people asking about other planets. Uh, Dimitri wanted to know how many planets have people gone to? And, um, and then another, actually, let's, let's answer that one. And then I've got okay. one that I think a lot of people are, are thinking about at least this week. Okay. 
So Dimitri, we have now, we have eight planets in our solar system. There was nine, but Pluto got kicked out because it didn't, you know, adhere to some of the, the rules that some of the uh, astronomers are, 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 have come up with. So in our eight planets, we have only been to one other planet, which is Mars, but it's not humans. It's probes that have actually landed on the Martian surface. So we have Curiosity up there. We have, uh, uh, you know, many different rovers. I think maybe like 25 to 30 different rovers have actually been on the Martian surface looking for water, uh, doing soil samples, you know, getting ready for humans to one day go there. And we've been to the moon, which is not a planet. It's our, our satellite going around uh, orbiting the Earth. And we're planning to go back to the moon one day. So moon and Mars would be, you know, spherical planet-like things that we're going to go to as, as human beings um, one day soon. And maybe maybe you'll be going. I, I got to think somebody from this class, right? This is that generation's most Definitely. fascinated by space people. And, and they've got the benefit of, uh, of learning from Leland, which I should also point out. This isn't the last one. We've got classes the next couple months, basically every month for the rest of the year. Um, more classes. Hey, one other for you, but I think a lot of people are thinking about now is we've had a lot of people ask some variation of, do you believe in aliens? And then another one is, did we just discover life on Venus last week? Ah, uh, so the alien one, we have, we have so many different satellites, whether they're on the ground or, I mean, you know, we're, lo we're listening, we're looking for signs of life out there. And we have these things called exoplanets that are in other solar systems that are actually, we have identified that they have temperatures that are similar to what we have here on earth and they have water. So if you have heat and you have water, that's usually a good combination for having life. And so we wanna explore those planets. Now we can't get there, but we can use our assets uh, space telescopes and different things like that to kind of view them. And then, you know, we're always looking at Mars because Mars, we think may have had water back at another time. And so we want to make sure that whatever happened to Mars, if it had water, it doesn't happen to us, you know, with temperatures and climate and those types of things. And on Venus, we identified something called phosphines. And phosphines are they, they are actually things that are made by humans or by animals. And so, so the question is, if there's phosphines in the atmosphere of Venus, is it signs of life or past life? And so a lot of the scientists and chemists are trying to figure out what is the mechanism for creating a phosphine with that environment of chemicals on in the Venus atmosphere. And so we're still trying to figure out exactly if it was, you know, people, humans, aliens, something that actually created the phosphine, or was it a combination of reactions that took place with other chemicals to give us the signature of those phosphines? And now the question is, do I believe in aliens? Exactly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I know the answer. So we have all these planets, right? And I think Carl Sagan said, was it Carl Sagan? I think it said, if there wasn't other life out there, what a waste of space. So I think that we have to keep looking. We haven't found anything yet, right? We found water, we found heat, but there may be something out there in a microbe or, you know, or is there, you know, a, a interesting shaped head, green, big eyed thing that we all say that's what an alien looks like, but are there things that look like us? You know, there are beings that look like us. So. There's a possibility we have to keep searching. You have to keep studying. You have to keep learning more at Varsity Tutors so that you can get better tools for us to investigate down the road to see what we can find. And maybe we'll find some friendly people out there that can help us advance ourselves even more to do things here for people on planet Earth. Man, that's perfect. That's uh, it's one, it's a great place to leave it. Let me, while I'm talking, because I want to make sure everybody knows the rules, I'm going to pop up. Here are the rules to, uh, to post yourself in Instagram. 
tag Leland tag varsity tutors, and you'll be entered to win that astronaut patch and, uh, and an autograph picture. Um, as Leland mentioned, it, it may be up to your generation to discover aliens. And so he's going to be back um, a couple times this fall. Um, that next class check back soon for details at varsity tutors.com, but it will involve a homemade build your own rocket project. So, um, so we're excited about that. We're going to make sure you guys are prepared to discover what's out there. So Here's the rules for that contest, Leland. I think that's a great place to end it. So it's not goodbye. It's just see you later because we've got some great classes coming up. Any uh, any last thoughts on the way out the door, Leland? Hey, I really appreciate you guys tuning in. I look forward to talking to you again very soon. Study hard, you know, stay positive, stay hopeful. We're going to get through all the things we're going through and we're going to see some of you in space one day soon. Godspeed on your journey. Thanks for coming in. Thank you to Leland. Thanks everybody at the uh, mission control team. Your last job is wave goodbye to, uh, to Leland and everybody watching this out there. And um, yeah, thanks everybody for joining and uh, we'll see you back at Varsity Tutor soon.